He'll tell you what they called him, but he was like the mini policeman. Oh boy. I remembered when Granddaddy actually moved to Government House. Um, it was a Sunday, everything was closed down, and I heard the vehicle is here. I wanted to see what this vehicle looked like, who was coming to, and I saw a police officer come out in this big black vehicle. He had two crowns or uh, striped on his, on his shirt. Coincidentally, his name was Sergeant Butler. Interesting. Interesting. But he was not a family member, but he that was his position at the time. I remember him. He was tall. That's right. Very tall slim, and lanky. Very slim. And such a wonderful man. Yes, he was. And I just sat there on the pond steps at, at the store and saw Grammy and Granddaddy depart. They and left I, you? And I was, that was my despondency. They left you? Yes, they left me. Okay. Oh, and my. I was saying, how could I be here? And they've gone somewhere else. And... Lo and behold, shortly thereafter, they came back for you. They came back for me. Oh, <laughs> so several days later, I was told I was moving to Government House, and of course, I was ecstatic at the time. Hi everybody, we want to welcome you to episode 4 of season 2 of the Butler Legacy Podcast. We really want to, first of all, give our producers, you know, the Scots Media, a rousing round of applause because, like we said in the last episode of the podcast, we are podcast winners of the Elevation Award, Loretta. Can you believe that? I felt, I felt so special. I am so proud. I felt special. I know you did, but we felt even more special that we use an all Bahamian production team young people, young entrepreneurs who are doing a world-class job. And so I'm sure it was because of their expertise, their professionalism, that we were elevated to be the winners of the Elevation Award. Absolutely, Loretta. So first of all, we wanted to get that out of the way and just really welcome you. We hope you guys have been enjoying these podcasts. Again, when we started this journey, our focus is really about sharing our story about legacy and the opportunity that both Loretta and even today our special guest joins uh, as a family member to, to share our legacy. And so we want to encourage you to, to think about your own legacy and this idea of entrepreneurship and how do we continue to help young companies and young organizations to develop. And so we want to just welcome you and we hope that you continue to give us that feedback, follow us on social media. But Loretta, Loretta. And to encourage other Bahamians to build their own legacies as well. Absolutely. That's so important. You know, it is such a delight when we're able to actually not just bring guests on that are not family, but it is a special, special time when we're able to bring in our own family members to even add more depth to the stories that we share. Absolutely. You know, with, with others. And so today, Franklin... But Loretta, um, before you go and introduce our guests... I want to thank our sponsors. Oh, I forgot. How could you? Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited. I feel like we totally thrive in this space. Uh, Absolutely. Forgive me. To, to, to the Butler Foundation, Legacy Foundation, I want to say a very special thanks for making this happen. And of course... I tell you, this is the most amazing environment. I feel absolutely creative, relaxed, wonderful when I'm in this space at the Echo Art Gallery at Bahamar in the beautiful island of New Providence, Bahamas. Thank you, Bahama and Echo Gallery and Butler Legacy Foundation for being our sponsors for making this podcast possible. Now, without further ado. <laughs> without further ado, <laughs> I, I was so excited. Exactly, I and know. And you cut me off. Sorry about that. You know? <laughs> anyway, getting back to it, I am happy today that I have a younger cousin. Well, a lot of you are younger than me. You guys are a little generation behind me, you know, just a tad. But we're so happy because, you know, today we have Alan, who is the current CEO of Milo B. Butler and Sons. And of course, he is my younger cousin, your older cousin. Absolutely. But you know, the most interesting thing about Alan is that he actually can tell us firsthand what it was like to actually live in the household of Sir Milo and Lady Caroline Butler and to grow up from a baby. He was the baby um, and he was brought up by Uncle Frank and Aunt Nita and Aunt Emmy and Granddaddy and Grammy all in the household. So he was like, he was like almost a, 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 an afterthought in the household, <laughs> you know? But he has firsthand experience. 
So, Alan, we want to welcome you to the Butler Legacy Podcast. A pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, to join both Frankie and Loretta here in this, in this space. Um, uh, I must say, I must, was hoping to be on this a long time ago. I feel like a star now, actually, to join you, you guys you are among, among the ranks you of are, greatness. You are a star. star. He you was a star, star from the time he was a little kid. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I'm sure you're going to tell us more today about how much of a star you were from the, almost the day you were born. Oh, so listen, uh, Alan, thank you. It's and, a pleasure. Uh, you know, congratulations, obviously, on your like, kind of recent, I guess, in the last, what, two, three years now? A, CEO? a year, a year. Yeah, year and a some, yeah. I see you, Milo Butler. So, congratulations in that regard. Thank you, and congratulations to you both on your awards winning. I mean, kudos to you. I mean, we are proud as a family. We don't often say it, but we are proud of what you guys have accomplished. You all have done very well and put a very great mark for for the family at large. And from the bottom of my heart and my own family, immediate family, we say thank you. Thank oh. you very, very well, much. Well, we really appreciate that. But I don't think any of this would have been possible without having great ancestors. That's Indeed. Sure. And, Indeed. you know, we give God thanks, as, you know, our forebears always told us, we have a goodly uh, heritage. heritage. Absolutely. You know, we all grew up being reminded of, of that. Of course, of course. And so um, the reason we're able to celebrate and share this and do so, so well because we have a story to share we do have a story we have a story to share yes. and you know alan um just so we can segue into how you are a part of this story i don't know if franklin knows this but you know when alan was born um back in the day uh and I'm saying back in the day because Carmichael is a whole different dynamic today. Absolutely. Um, but when, when Alan was born, Uncle, Uncle Basil and Aunt Sylvia had already made their home mm. on Carmichael Road. And to go to Carmichael Road was almost like going on a journey. Wow. Because not only was it far, but also they still had very limited population in that oh. part of the island. And so when you think of the Pine Barrens, um, predominantly Carmichael Road was Pine Barren. Interesting. And Alan, because of his um, respiratory issues, absolutely, um, as a baby and all the draft that used to be on Carmichael Road. Absolutely, right. They said they need to bring him uptown where we, where we had more people and know. less density of trees and less draft. And, and, Emmy, Al and Emmy was instrumental behind that That's because she right. was the nurse. That's you know? right. And yeah. Alan was brought into the household of Granddaddy and Grammy be for his health reasons. Interesting. And he became a part of, you know, the fabric of that household totally. I love learning so much about our family. Alan, <laughs> tell, tell me more. What else I don't know? <laughs> well, I do remember. I, I, I'm glad that Laurie brought that up. I mean, that was something that was always reminded of me as well, too, that and Emmy was the one who actually got it started. She was a nurse, um, and oftentimes a, a very controlling nurse. Many folks would know her to be very, very large, and I do remember I think they're running our family that controlling thing, but <laughs> And the largeness. <laughs> <laughs> to walk behind an Emmy it was, it was actually felt like she was larger than life. She really, she really just walked with that sort of, that sort of dominance in her, in her space. And of course, growing up with Grammy and Granddaddy, it was a one, I felt like the 11th child. However, I called everybody in the house, mommy or daddy, whether they were female or male, oh, depending, wow. depending where they were. Yeah. So that, that was how I, I grew up and started on Uncle Frankie was daddy at the time because that's who I lived with. He hadn't married yet. Yeah. And um, um, of course, and neither, was, and neither was mommy. And of course, he had grandma and granddaddy who was grandma and granddaddy, yeah. right? And so that's what, that was what it was like for me. And Emmy was also mommy as well, too. So that was that for me at that time. My cousin Angela and my cousin and my sister Anastasia, who is now deceased, also lived in that space for a while too. Because Anita then was headmistress of R and Highbury High, High, then going on to become R and Bailey right. School. So um, all of that dynamics was living in that space and so on, et cetera. But that was that was an experience, yeah. But you know, when we talk about the space, what what we need to remind people of is the space that Alan talks about is the homestead the butler homestead correct which was built um just after the turn of the century mm. um the clapboard structure I two body you. two story structure in the pond where downstairs was the pond general store. the general store uh -huh. um the grocery store the liquor store the everything store and of course upstairs was the residence where some lived. and so yes alan was very easily the 11th child 
um, being brought into that environment. And as he mentioned, our other cousins, Angela and Anastasia, were there, but not as permanently as he was. And so that is the homestead that Alan was brought into by Aunt Emmy. And each one of the adults in that household were actively involved in Milo B. Butler and Son. Absolutely. Except Granddaddy at that stage, who was definitely active in frontline politics. politics. Well, correct, just correct. Oftentimes, as we traveled out, um, he would have three of his grandchildren to travel with him. It was myself, Craig, and actually yours truly, Loretta, oh, yeah. who often went out with him, and, and he would just be going out to various places of whatever his interest was at the time. I think it was then he was Minister of Health, and at one time he was Minister of Agriculture. So during our summer months, that was our outing. We would go out and travel with him. Um, all over the place, and of course, I was and down one of, Carmichael Road to the farm, and I'm down Carmichael Road to the farm, <laughs> precisely. But I was always trying to argue for the for the front seat um, um, of, of the vehicle. But of course, it was never given allowed to be given to me because of Craig um, Loretta's younger brother and his disability. At the time, he had to sit in a particular position, mm. and I always was jealous of that. I want to sit in the front seat. I think that was my first experience where I fell out of the vehicle because at that time the doors were extremely heavy. They didn't have the safety locks on them. Uh. And Loretta spoke before airing on the show. She spoke to me about my saddle head, but I said, anyway, <laughs> she used to give me the, no the notation of my saddle head between she and my other cousins, older cousins, who lived down the road at the funeral home about my saddle head. Well, anyway, that was the first experience of me falling out the, he falling out the vehicle and Grammy having to rub my head down with alcohol oh, because of my falling out. Then, of course, it happened again in the Daimler. That's right. And it also happened again in the Princess. I said, oh, my God, I must have a... You always had a head start. <laughs> <laughs> but, Literally. But, but, you know, I think, I think it's so important for us to let Alan talk about that Absolutely. because, you know, Alan has the unique perspective, as I said, of actually growing from that pawn yep. store when granddaddy was you know having to go every day to the um to parliament or whatever he did and then in 1973 when granddaddy transitioned as governor general yeah, i remember, I um, I remember. you know uh and alan was right there i mean he was like the he'll tell you what they called him but he was like the mini policeman oh boy i remembered when granddaddy actually moved to government house um it was a sunday Everything was closed down, and I heard the vehicle is here. I wanted to see what this vehicle looked like, who was coming to, and I saw a police officer come out in this big black vehicle. He had two crowns or, or stripes on his, on his shirt. Coincidentally, his name was Sergeant Butler. Interesting. Interesting, but he was not a family member, but he, that was his position at the time. I remember him. He was tall. That's right, very tall slim, and lanky. Very and slim. such a wonderful man. Yes, he was. And... I just sat there on the pond steps at, at the store and saw Grammy and Granddaddy depart. They and left I, you? And I was, that was my despondency. They left you? Yes, they left me. Oh, oh And my. I was saying, how could I be here? And they've gone somewhere else. And lo and behold, shortly thereafter. They came back for you? They came back for me. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> so several days later, I was told I was moving to government house. And of course, I was ecstatic at the time. So... What did, you, what did you know about... What was happening? Yeah, tell us. I mean, you were young. You were still a, a, a kid, really. Yes. I very mean, honestly, how, what did you understand of that? I only understood that Granddaddy was moving into a big house. He was given a, a different position, and he was called the Governor General. And so I did not understand what all of that meant. I just heard what it meant. I could recite it. But beyond that, I did not understand what that meant. Of course, I began to see things a little differently as we got into it and got into that whole role because here it was now, I was living with some Milo at Government House, but the only grandchild, so I was kind of lonely, but at the same time, there were certain privileges that were given to me that were considered royal. I think when Daddy wanted to make an example yeah. for his grandchildren in that he said, I'm gonna have the first fair skin <laughs> or a colored living here in, at Government House. So he brought his family. And so besides taking me, he made it a ritual on a regular basis to actually host all of his extended family, all of his children and their children, to Government House at least once a month, wow. where they would come and have Sunday dinner at Government House. And so we would have that fellowship. But of course, living at Government House, there was things that were set out in terms of my agenda, and my agenda was carried out throughout 
government house as though I was living in a palace. Mm. So on at eight o'clock, all of the people who work there, Master Allen goes to breakfast. At eight at eight thirty, Master Allen has to be to school. At three o'clock, Master Allen has to be picked up. At eight fifteen, Master Allen is no, at five o'clock Master Allen is to have is to have um, um brunch or I mean supper. And um, at 8.15, Master Allen is to have dinner. At 9 o'clock, Master Allen is to be in bed. You were spoiled. I, well, you <laughs> that's, were clearly, spoiled. that's what everybody used to say. Oh, yeah. my God. And so there was this program that was given out to everybody throughout Government House. that and actually had. And you were a part of it. And I was a part of it. Master yeah. Allen. <laughs> now, you see, this, this for me... <laughs> <laughs> We was working our butts off. <laughs> <laughs> I was living a good you know, life. You know, and, 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 you know, he was just a kid, right? But, you know, from a very early age, we all had jobs to do. And he gone, he gone like the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, was, that was part of my experience. And of course, and, and in doing that, I got to mingle with a lot of dignitaries and persons I met firsthand. So they became like second nature to me and actually kind of extended family. So... Granddaddy hosting a lot of the dignitaries, the then Prime Minister Lyndon Penling, former Deputy Prime Minister Arthur Hanna, and Livingston Coakley, and, and, and likes of others, and so on. Um, Clement Maynard, and so on, et cetera. All of those individuals come to Government House, and they're all dressed up in their suits, and so forth, et cetera. And here I am coming down from a sleepy slumber, in my shorts and T-shirt, and then tugging on Granddaddy, can I get a taste of whatever it is that you're having? Yeah. <laughs> and so I was just being a kid and, of course, just doing as I w wanted to do. Of course, the police would be playing over in the, in the gardens, the entertainment music for those who were there, for those festivities and so on. And so you just maintained a regular childhood, you, whether you had on your pajamas or Absolutely. whether you were dressed for the occasion. Absolutely. Nobody shooed you out. No one shooed me out. And as a matter of fact, what, what really, really brought an icicle to the cake was when we hosted a... Um, a state, former, a former a president. State dinner? A, a nurse, Don't a tell me you came down in your pajamas. I came down in pajamas when President um, um, <laughs> General Gawan, who actually came from Nigeria, uh. who actually came to, to the Bahamas, he was actually in exile from Nigeria at the time. And of course, he was then hosted by the Prime Minister Lyndon Pinling and the house. And of course, he stayed there in Government House. He was a little two pint man, sh um, tall man. So <laughs> he and I kind of look eye to eye. So we, so, so, so we sort of got on very, very well. And of course, he always used to say to me, um, even though I selected like mingle with the adults, Alan, early to bed, early to, to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Oh, so wow. he often said these things. And of course, after that, my surrogate mother, mother at the time, who often was to try to keep him in check, um, Dame Marguerite, would often say to me, Alan, remember what Gawan used to say to you? Early to bed, early to rise. And I said, okay, yeah. Okay. That means time for you then to then get, out, there, of big people, get <laughs> out of big business, people's business. Exactly, business. right? Exactly. But, <laughs> you know, Alan, um, that, that is all so fascinating. And, you know, um, this was the first time we had a Bahamian resident in Governor, the government, government house. house. That's right. And you were a part of that history. And so that was fascinating. But, you know, I'm sure along the way, Granddaddy and Grammy did not forget the principles they taught to their children and oh, before no. you guys went to government house because i know you still had to go to church you still had to you know do all of the rituals and everything that they had instilled in us but over the years tell us a, a little bit more about sir milo your recollection yes. and how he actually um conducted himself in private and in public from what you saw Grindaddy in private was the same way he was in public. He was a gentleman, through and through, from what I saw, through and through a gentleman. Suppers at evening times with Grammy was um, a way of showing how you could be a gentleman. We would be upstairs, and at, at a very tender age, he would escort Grammy down, grab her by the arm, and escort her downstairs. And of course, me seeing that, thought that that must have been a privilege to do something of the sort. So I would run to beat him to do the same, to escort her down the stairs. And so those gentlemanly-like attitudes were faster than me at a very, very early age because of the fact that Grindaddy displayed them as a, a way of, I guess you could say, as a, well, as a, as a fun thing to do. And of course, it then became a part of your own everyday okay. living. Um, so that was what he, he instilled in, in, in that regard. I also recollect, of course, going out to the straw market and hearing the people calling him daddy, daddy, daddy. 
never understood what it they meant. Granddaddy, daddy, daddy. Interesting. And people out the storm, and of course, this is an afternoon drive. And it didn't matter how old they were. That's that was right. the respect they showed for him. Him, that's right. And and the service he was giving to them personally. Absolutely, oh. absolutely. Let's tell the story. This was what I found interesting. I didn't so, want to cut you off from that. Yeah, so he, he, they would call him daddy, 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 and he would be out there, and he would just pass by, and of course, the police would be driving, right, the chauffeur would be driving around very, very slowly, and he would say, stop, 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 let me greet them. And nobody asked him for anything. They just wanted to shake his hand and continually just tell him thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, mm. thank you, thank you. And he saw this as a privilege to go and do in the afternoons. Now, we made an outing out of it. We would go out and guess how many cruise ships were actually in at the time. Mm. And, of course, that was part of the outing to actually see the straw vendors because they were actually then on what is now the, the port. That's right. They were actually there with, their, with all of their goods because they had no building then at the time. They were out pretty much in the open sun selling all of their straw work and so on. And so that was a treat, and, but then an experience. But I, it wasn't until I got older that I began to understand and appreciate what it was they were calling him daddy for mm -hmm. and why they, 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 they were because so, so, so you, gratified. Before you and before Granddaddy went up there, which we continued after Granddaddy went up to Government House, he used to have savings accounts for Absolutely. the straw vendors. Ah, okay. I think and I heard so this. several times a week we would go down um, Alan spoke to us, especially Raleigh, Claudette, and myself. Right. Um, we, Granddaddy would take us down to help him collect the money from the straw vendors, which he in turn would then put in the Royal Bank of Canada. I see. And so they had savings accounts and they all had these little black books. That's right. Um, where um, they would know how much money they had saved and then when they wanted to withdraw it. So they not only looked at him as a leader in um, the political world, but they looked to him with trust and respect because he took care of their interests and ensured that they were able to save. save. And Granddaddy was a person, um, he loved to drive. So when he went to Government House, and you know, things might have been more restricted, but they realized that he liked to be among his people. So when you saw this very imposing vehicle that Alan fall out a couple of times, because <laughs> these, these Daimler, these Daimler had doors like what open like the British taxi cab. That's right. Where they open up in the middle uh -huh. That's right. and then come out like this. That's right. Uh -huh. Like the the doors are backwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how he get to fall out. <laughs> the black cab. You know, <laughs> you know, but the, the the Daimlers were so huge and imposing. There was one called the Princess. That's right. That's it right. It looks like a it looked like a pregnant car. That's right. You know, it really did. It, it looked like it looked like a car with a belly in the back. <laughs> you know, and then there was the the the, the Triumph, the small one. And the, and the, and then the newer Daimler. Remember, it didn't have that big hump right, in the back. Right, right, right. Which was right. a fancy one. But they were the only cars like that on the road. Wow. And they was going down Bainton. Mm. They was going Carmichael Road. They Everywhere. Was going, they, I think that's the first time them cars was going in the area. Because <laughs> Granddaddy always wanted to stay in touch with the people. the people. That's right. And of course, they'd go to Blue Hill Road as well to, to his businesses, which brings us back to, you know, your involvement and, and the involvement of our uncles and our aunts and all of them that were involved in the business. So not only did Alan have the ability to grow up under Grammy and Granddaddy, but tell us about how your, you evolved to become one of the first three G's that got involved in the in, in the actual food, the Milo B. Butler food business. Third generation. Well, it started, I guess, for me when um, my uncle Milo and Uncle Asa actually were running the the, bar, the former Bargain Mart, all right, which we now know today as Milo Butler Mart, so to speak. And um, um, my cousin Milo was a year or so older than myself. And he was given the privilege to go and work there as a bagging boy. And I never felt as though Milo was any better off than I was. Or he, because of the fact that he was older than men, he should have more privilege. So I wanted to go too, to go and be a bagger. So You left Government House to go be a packing boy. And I went to be a, pa a, pa a bagger. But actually, we had actually moved from Government House by this time. Okay. Mm. Because by this time, Granddaddy had already taken sick. Okay. And so we were living in Highland Park at the time. When, 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 that, when, okay. the, when this happened. But you wanted to be a packing boy. But I wanted to be a, I wanted to, I wanted to, no, I wanted to be privileged like all the other, my other cousins were privileged. <laughs> and so therefore, I didn't figure that they were any better off than me. So my cousin Craig and my cousin Milo were given this privilege to go and 
bag. And I said, well, shoot, you all can't leave me behind because we were the three musketeers. So I had to go and, and buy groceries too. And I remember the first lady giving me my first tip. It must have been 50 cents. And I said, boy, I was ever so elated. And it was a paper book. The paper 50, the paper 50, 50 cents. cents, right? The very, oh very goodness. first tip I ever Which got. Which we don't even see no, anymore. No, you don't. Yeah. I you don't, don't even think they print them <laughs> That's anymore. That's right. But that was the first tip I ever got when I, was, when I was so excited. And, of course, it just encouraged me to then to do more. And so, of course, it just sort of evolved. And then, then my summers were involved. At that time, as summers and, and Christmases came about, um, um, your older sister, Clarice, was actually involved with the business. And she, being involved with the business, used to actually have, was instructed to actually... Um, have the home center all decorated up for Christmas. Mm. And her doing, because she managed that section or was in charge of marketing for the company at the time, she actually decided to put all those. And so she used me as, because I was a kid, to actually demonstrate the toys. So Christmas time, I was demonstrating toys. Yeah, and you toys. was making money. That's right. Oh, my goodness. That's right. So I was doing that and enjoying myself you know, and helping customers. And, and making money. And making money. Don't the forget the too. part about making, making money. money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were making, we were making money. About, like, sure they wasn't paying them too much money. No, 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 no. No, but remember the tips. now, it was the tips. It was the tips. It was and the see, tips. No, no, we never got paid. I, I don't no, even no, know if we got paid, paid at all, yeah. actually. Oh, shoot. <laughs> if I tell you what my first paycheck was, it's, oh, wow. <laughs> it's okay. So anyway, I, I, that happened, and that happened over Christmas. Then summers came around, and... As I got older, I was able to, to work, and I, my first real working job when I got paid was actually working in the warehouse as a picker, mm. and my paycheck per week was $40, and I was like, oh my God, I was excited with $40. Yes, you were. That's right, so, but every week, all of it went to my bank account. <laughs> Anita, Anita saw to that. <laughs> At that time, it was Barclays Bank, and she made sure all of it went to my bank account, and anything I needed for an, like, an allowance, I had to work extra for it, which meant cleaning her car uh -huh. or doing some other chore in the house uh, or whatever have you. So despite the fact that you may say I grew up spoiled, there were a lot of things I had to learn to do and to do on my own too as, as an older person. But this speaks to what, you know, the common thread that we have constantly talked about in this podcast, because a lot of people look at butlers and they say, oh, you know, well, whatever they say. But the reality is they never appreciate that we were actually brought up on hard, um, work. On hard work, on discipline, and on values. Absolutely. And um, when I told um, Tim Smith mm -hmm. that we didn't understand the value of a dollar, we understood the value oh, of penny, a penny. penny. That's right. And so I think it's important, you know, what Alan is saying, it just resonates and obviously um, repeats what I've constantly said. As family members, we had no privileges. The only privilege we had was you better go work. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Whatever we made, we were always encouraged that you had to save it. That's right. And um, savings was very important because they would tell us all the time, it ain't what you make. It's how you use it. It's what you save. That's right. <laughs> you save. That's right. That's you know, right. it's what you save. And so for... Um, what Alan has shared, that if he wanted to have what we call, what these, I, I don't even know if it's what parents call today, but pocket change, yep. you had way. to go and do extra work for that. You had to do chores for that. Your money that you made, as little as it was, wasn't really yours. That's it had to bank. go in the bank. Absolutely. And, and so she did that for me. And I do remember when I made my first withdrawal from that account and noticed how much I had actually saved. Over the no, summer, no, you didn't save. <laughs> How much was saved for you? How much was saved for me? Then, sorry, <laughs> correction. <laughs> How much was saved for me? Um, and what I was using it because Anita then said to me, "Okay, well, because you did this now, you have to pay for your own trip to go wherever it is you want I to go." I got you. And so when I saw what I had saved, I said, "My gosh." I want to go on this trip, but I don't know if I want to have all this money withdrawn from my account at one time. But it, it gave me the appreciation for what... It was the one, lesson. It was the lesson. It was It the was lesson. definitely the lesson. And, and seeing that done and knowing how much could be done if, if you know where to continue. The first lesson between knowing the difference between your needs and your wants. And your wants, absolutely. <laughs> so you started absolutely. reconciling right away. Boy, I have this, but you know, I want this trip, but you know, I don't want to lose all of this. That's right, I, absolutely. You know? And that, I think, is where a lot of us and we can help other people in their journey towards um, becoming um, successful entrepreneurs 
understanding the value of the value of your money. The value of your money. That's right. Absolutely. You know? And to think about how, how old are we, right? Because I think a lot of people think that, you know, wealth or, you know, these positions that we benefit from or our experience in business or something that we happen, we, we learn in college. I tell people most of the lessons we learn actually started in our households. That's right. Oh, no, listen, everything. As long as you're old enough to understand, that's when it starts. That's the point. I, it, it, it started exactly in our household. When people use the excuse today that teachers need to do this and teachers, your children's teachers are their parents. Absolutely. They are their first teachers. And we learned, and you know, we were also told no matter what, whether we were in Government House, Marlin Drive, or in the pond. I will never forget Sunday dinners, obviously, before they, after they did the prayer and, you know, children must know their place. We always was taught, spare the rod to spoil, spoil the child. child. Absolutely. And so that meant, and we, there was also another saying, would you like the Board of Education to on, the seat of, on seat of, your seat of knowledge. knowledge? Absolutely. And that meant we were going to get a good whooping. That's absolutely. right. When Daddy, when Daddy often used to say to me, I mean, here it is now. When, now that you say that, remind me of when I was living at Government House. You said I was spoiled. But I do remember doing some things that were not favorable in his sight. Mischievous. That's right. And so therefore... Going in the pool when you ain't supposed to be in the or, pool. Or going in the back of the yard and, and staying there for hours. And going in the kitchen and eating from Ms. Irma then when you ain't supposed was to be eating. Shh. I didn't know your story is better than I. <laughs> <laughs> so Ms. Anyway. Irma them had a kid in the house. They was spoiling him in the kitchen before supper time. <laughs> I don't care what the schedule said about my style. I didn't <laughs> get it in the spoons, You know? But I do remember Granddaddy going before the seat of... Uh, the, before the, the, the council. The council then was Grandma and Granddaddy. And if I did something wrong, Granddaddy often used to say, well, Derry, as we, that was his endearing mm -hmm. name for Grammy. Derry, should I beat him or should I spare him? And then she would say, well, um, spare him, spare him, sir. And so... His retort um, was... It, 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 would, it was <laughs> fine. He said, well, you got away this time. He said, but don't you... Said, but make sure that you don't do it next time. So the next time it happened, and she said, well, it's up to you, sir. And then after that, I, I just swallowed heavy. This is, you, you hear this language? This is how they spoke to each other. You know, you know? And, and so I swallowed heavy. And he said to you, Alan, spare the rod, spoil the child. And I want you to know, this is, this is going to hurt me, me more, more than, than it hurts you. hurt you. I'm telling you. And those they, were the last words before the thrashing came. Whenever they told us that I could oh. not figure it out. What do you mean it's going to hurt you? <laughs> yeah. And you're, you're giving That's me right. the wailing. It's amazing. But that same belt that when daddy constantly used to beat me with, I wore that belt till it wore out after he passed away. Whoa, wow. It's amazing that, that that stood around my waist because I do remember the lessons and it was my reminder of life and everything that he taught me yeah. that I wore around my waist. It's sort of a, a gird of righteousness as the Bible speaks of. Yeah. So that, that, was my, that was my remembrance of Good. that as well too. Alan Loretta, both of you had the benefit of living with granddaddy. Uh, something that obviously I didn't have the privilege, I was born after his passing. What were the kind of top three lessons you took? I hear all the stories, but what are the three things that, in your adulthood now, I mean, what are the three things that really stand out, each of you, in terms of? For me, I do not believe that Granddaddy began anything without prayer. Wow. Okay? Anything, any gathering, everything. Prayer was an integral, the most central part of every aspect of life. Wow. All right? That was the first thing. Second thing I remembered, and I, I don't know if Alan can back me up on this, he wasted nothing. Absolutely. <laughs> nothing was wasted. Oh, no. I will remember, and I got to share this, granddaddy, well, he never drank coffee or tea. No, he never. never. Drank, drank, no never hot drank, beverages. He never drank hot beverages. So um, he liked ice. And of course, he always grew aloe plants so that he can have those in the morning. But after he's eaten his aloe plants, he then ate his fruit. We used to have bananas come from family islands, from the farm, whatever. And of course, people would buy hands of bananas. Mm -hmm. But you know, when the bananas turn brown, you can't sell them anymore. So you all got to eat them. No, you're not y'all. Grand <laughs> Granddaddy eat them. Granddaddy take those upstairs to the house. That's and, right. And I'm going to tell you, when I tell you he wasted nothing, he would peel back the brownest banana. Absolutely. And I would be like, I'm, I'm like ready to throw up because I'm like, how are you going to eat that? Just like that. And he's like, oh, this is so good. 
And this is after ah. he's eaten his owl. So that was a lesson that you throw away nothing. nothing. You throw away nothing. absolutely nothing. Okay, and Grammy Butler lived by that as well because she never allowed the fruit to go so bad that she could not cook or make something with them. Waste not, want not. That's right, waste <laughs> not, want not. And then lastly, I think um, this, I think, was the most compelling thing is that no, we're not better than anybody. Absolutely. Wow. We're not better than anybody else. Even after you grew up as royalty, Alan, you're not better than nobody else? Nobody else. else. Well. Wow. You know, so I don't know if Alan would sort of choose those things, but that is what resonates with me. And I think that is what was passed on through every generation from his mother, Sir Milo, and Lady Caroline, our parents. Down and, and probably we try to do it with our kids too now. Yeah. I think what I would add to that, because I, I, I take what Laurie said and I, I would agree with her. Um, the other one would be leadership, because mm. Grammy often said to me, even after he passed away, be leaders, not followers. Wow. Go against the grain. You don't have to follow all the Joneses. Yep. Stand on your own two feet and believe in what it is that you are doing and believe that you're doing it to the honor and glory of God. That is true. They always tell us never to be followers. Oh, if he go jump off the bridge, you can jump behind him and do well, it. That's right. So, so that, that, that was one of the things. And and to be, like Laurie would have stated, you know, to mingle with kings, but never lose it's common touch. Yeah. So therefore, being able to see that yourself, you're no better off than anybody else. And I, that's one of the things I think that has helped me too in terms of my own grooming, even being in the bargain mart. I may have been asked to speak on a particular topic. Some of my own customers would have seen me on the news. But they were also very happy to know that the very next day the they can come into the bargain mart and I was someone who they could touch, have a conversation with, and I was not someone so removed mm -hmm. from them. And that was, that was one of the things I, I think I took away from that as well, too. That's right. And Granddaddy actually demonstrated that in every aspect of his life because, you know, what, and, and Grammy as well, because we were almost like the epicenter of the marketplace where we were situated that's in the right. pond. That's right. Between the pond and Potter's Key Dock. Potter's Key Dock, that's right. And of course, central to Bay, Bay Street. And what we found was that we met people from every family island, every um, economic sphere of New Providence Absolutely. came to that shop. And if they drank their half pint of liquor, on the on the step and got drunk, we still could not be rude to them because right. they were customers. That's right. McGee proud one from that. That's I remember. right. London. <laughs> London, you know, that's right. And, and other people Absolutely. like that. That's right. And we also learned because even though London, the more he drank, the more intelligent he became. Him. He could speak. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <Look> <laughs> no, I'm not joking. That's he right. was a phenomenal speller. Wow. Yes. His vocabulary was vast. That's right. And the more he drank, he'd be London, spell such and such. That's and right. he would spell it, and we learned and very that articulate. we could learn from everyone Everybody, that that's came right. to that wow. store. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. They were Incredible. philosophers. <laughs> Incredible. 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 You never even heard of London, eh? Uh, I only know the place. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had people, like characters like Cool Breeze. Very cool Breeze, that's right. You know, McGee, whatever will be. Whatever will, will be. It will be. They were philosophers. They were... I mean, just like my friend Potcake. Yeah, 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 you know, people yeah. look at Potcake and they be like, oh, you know, Potcake is a street person. But have you ever seen some of the profound yeah, yeah, yeah. things that, that he, he writes? writes? That's right. You know? Absolutely. And so we, we, I think when we were taught that we're no better than anybody else, we had to respect everyone. Absolutely. And we realized that all of those individuals, no matter where they came from, had something to contribute towards their own well-being and the well-being of all of us at, mm -hmm. at large, you know, so and you could learn from them as they well, too. They were comfortable too. coming to, to the right. butlers, yep. you know, or, or, you know, some Milo store or whatever. And they, they, they were comfortable. I mean, it was like, it was like the central meeting place, whether they came to get kerosene or whether they came to get ice or whether they came to get standard rum. That's right. You know, rum, which you've never heard about. But, you know, as it evolved, Alan, you know, Milo B. Butler and Sons became so much more than the pawn store. Absolutely. Correct. It became... Um, um, Uncle Frank and Aunt Nita and Uncle Basil Uncle and Joe. Uncle Lisa, all of our aunts and uncles. This is this was the next generation, and today, you know, the Milo B. Butler and Sons may not be wholly in the food distribution business. Um, a lot of our cousins and siblings are doing well in other spheres yes. of life. 
Um, but speak to the dynamics of where Milo B. Butler and Sons and what it's all about today and how it got there. Um, I would say that it was really a lot of influence by Uncle Frank in many, many instances. And of course, Uncle Raleigh, um, when they began to venture into the other areas of business, because we saw that the food business alone was really not doing all that we needed it to do and what we wanted it to do. Um, if I must put this plug in there, um, and I think this was said even too by some of my uncles, we as black Bahamians do not do very well with supporting each other as well as we should. And so therefore there were many businesses who I think um, who would have seen the butlers, I guess in their opinions, thrive or seem to be thriving and doing very, very well. And they didn't need to shop with us because we really, we really had it made in the shade, so to speak. And so other avenues were actually sought because here it is now, these same individuals who they thought were doing exceptionally well in the food business probably were not. Not probably, they weren't in many instances. So other things sort of evolved. We got into the liquor business because of the fact that the food business was not doing as well as it should. And that would have been back from first generation where um, we used the liquor to try to help them with. And of course, it's having 30 days because you didn't have no license to rich to sell. Explain liquor after 30 days for our guests, yeah, tell, please. Tell, 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 tell the younger people what, what 30, 30 days, days is. is. So 30 days would have meant that you got 30 days in prison if you were so caught selling alcohol um, illegally. Illegally in the Bahamas at that time. And that was, that was the penalty for, for that. Yeah, you go to jail for 30 you days. You go to jail for 30, day, for 30 days. You go to jail for 30 days. And so that was what was actually happening. So there was means that they tried to use to try to augment the grocery business. Then, of course, after that... But my, I'm, I'm, let's give clarity to this. Butlers were not engaged in selling 30 days. We did actually have a general store yes. that had the license yes. for liquor. Yes. I think it's the only store ever that existed in the Bahamas that could sell liquor and grocery and dry goods side by side. Right. In the, in the pond, that was the case. I don't know of any food store today that can sell liquor. Okay. All right. Then. Yeah. But they, 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 I they think are. they changed it fairly recently. Yeah, they've changed it fairly recently. Oh, where y'all can sell liquor now? No, we can't. But, we they, can't. They, 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 but I know like in Grand Bahama, I think there's an opportunity where they can sell liquor. Okay, they can well, sell liquor. I, well, I know for many years. Mind you, there was a separation, but there was only one cash register. Absolutely. Right. Okay? Yeah. In the store, in the pond, um, there was the general merchandise and side. And the liquor store right there. And we were just parted off with a screen. I remember. And on the other side was our liquor store. Oh, right. But they all went into the same cash register. And the cash, in the cash register. Uh, but of course, at that time, even too, there was a time when they made us actually put, physically put, a cash register on that liquor side. So that, that evolved. Afterwards, I think what actually happened afterwards, we saw that we still really weren't cutting the mustard with even with, with those things. And so opportunities presented itself in the area of real estate and so on, et cetera. And so other investments were actually made spearheaded by Uncle Raleigh and Uncle Frank. Um, and some opportunities presented itself in Grand Bahama. And we sort of just got off into that. And then there were some other opportunities that came about too with some other investments and that sort of just sort of morphed into other things. And so therefore we found another company being formed, which we have um, under our belt called Milo Butler Investments. Um, that, that was actually a part of... Are you um, the head of that as well? No, I'm not the head of that. That's, actually, that's actually headed um, by Damien, my cousin Damien. Okay, Damien. Franklin's, Franklin's, okay. Franklin's brother. But, but uh, there's still the Milo, offshoots of Milo B. Butler. Yes, offshoots okay. of Milo B. Butler. Uh -huh. And I, that was the beginning. What happens at the beginning? But that was a part of further investments that we wished to, to, to have gone into. But we always stay true to the to the the grocery oh, and and then the the other businesses that we had as our what we call our core business, and so we had we had gone on with that and done some other investments and so on. But I think more interest was actually put into those things and not enough really put in at an earlier day, and not enough really put into the to the core business. In all fairness, though, I believe and correct me if I'm wrong, both of you, because you've both sat in that very same seat. Um, food is a very marginal um, return on yes. your investment. Yes, it is. You know, you invest a lot in it. It's a necessity. Everybody needs to buy food, obviously. There's a high um, rate of loss in food, whether it's to spoilage, to theft, or anything like that. 
But when you look at the involvement of Milo B. Butler today and what it represents with investments in real estate development, different stuff like that, I think it's important for our audience to understand that while your core business is what helped to create your, um, your wealth, um, it's important at some point to diversify. Am no I correct in saying that? I think you are correct in saying that. However, my opinion would not be to come out of it. My opinion would be you still keep a foothold in it because I think it lends to people that you actually, you have not transitioned, but you've actually created a bridge. Okay. All right? Um, and that's how I like to look at it. So therefore, I still see that there's a need for us to be in food. Right. But at the same time, though, too, these other investments that come about, by all means, well, let's embrace them the, as well, too. That keeps the legacy of Milo. Senior. Senior. Very much alive. Absolutely. And because that's, that's very, very important, you know. Um, and But I think that we also need to um, share that out of that and out of the genius of creating um, a food store and food stores, that you've been able to do other things and whether it's the diversity of the portfolios or the diversity of the offspring right yeah because you know you look at many of our cousins and stuff all you know exception, they're right. into all different facets absolutely. and uh, you know our extended family members you know all and, and doing well absolutely but, absolutely. but the um the springboard has been that initial impetus given to us by Mother B and Sir Milo and, and all of those. So think, think about it now, too. Our uncles and fathers did not um, have capital to put into what we now know as Butler's Funeral Home. Mm -hmm. So the sweat equity that was put in, even though my uncles and father had to work the business through the week, on Sundays, which was the atypical day for funerals to be held, they helped Uncle Raleigh, That's Loretta's correct. father. That's right. As, 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 as um, laborers in that vent, and as funeral directors and whatever else they had to help with hands, drivers, and so on, et cetera, that to help with true. funerals on, on Sundays primarily. I could see Uncle Milo now driving the hearse and yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, so all, of these, all of these things sort of helped and so forth, the so called Butler Enterprise. So, whatever your granddaddy's thing was, whatever your interest is, we prepared to support it. We want to make sure. If it's productive. If it's productive, right. And so therefore, that was how he wanted this to be. He wanted whatever it is that we were doing for us to be able to evolve. So if you wanted to get into computers, we would help you. You wanted to get into real estate, we would help I you. you. Whatever it is that you wish to do, we would help you. And we would work together as a family to help you, to give you that achieve catapult, that. to help you to achieve that. That's right. And to get you, to get you where you needed to go. That's, and see, this is the incredible story of family businesses. legacy yeah. and family businesses. Right. Because we know that not all of the uncles were able to go off to college and university. The sacrifice was made. Yep. Um, some of them went. went yeah. And then, of course, you know, um, some of them were highly successful. Some went and come back. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I mean, let's, let's speak truth, you know. Absolutely. I mean, not everyone was successful when they went off. Absolutely. My dad was supposed to go be a doctor. And he squandered the money, yeah, and he ended up being an undertaker. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not afraid to talk about that. Some went to London, some came back. Aunt Nita went off to, to school. And she, absolutely. Yeah. We, <laughs> been to London and back for everybody. <laughs> we, we, have a joke, we have a joke in the family. Yeah. They came back with a BLV, been to London and back. But Aunt Nita, on the other hand, um, there was, she was brilliant. And, you know, she became a successful educator, traveled around the world, then came back to the Bahamas. And granddaddy and those supported her in every aspect of that. And when she came back, the first female, I believe, Prince I could be corrected, to be a principal of a government school. Agreed. She was the first principal of a government school and the first principal of, of R. M. Bailey. Well, it was Highbury High. It was Highbury High at first. That's right. I'm that's saying. right. It was so as it transitioned, High. she was, and was there. And then they changed it over to R. M. Bailey. Yeah. And so she had some very great legs of iconic people who I consider iconic individuals who actually were her support. Things, Absolutely. Person, persons Winston, like Clement, Clement Winston Bethel. Saunders, Clement, Clement Bethel, Bethel um, Ms. Aris Monker, Winston, Winston, Winston per Ferguson. That's right. Um, Ms. Velma, Ms. Velma. Uh, I mean, they were all Thelma, outstanding Thelma Ferguson. educators. Ed um, absolutely. Outstanding educators. Yep. And, and if you looked, see, what we need to speak to is that 
Her whole thing was about excellence. No question. R.M. Bailey graduates back from the early 70s when that school was established, look at where they went in the they Bahamas today. today. That's right. Great. Leaders. I want to bring us back. Go ahead. Family businesses are complicated, Adam. I've sat in your seat. I pay homage to you, sir. I don't regret moving from that seat. Let's talk about some of the tensions okay. of family business. You and I have supported each other and disagreed. Talk about some of the lessons you've learned in your kind of fairly brief stint as a CEO, but even on the broader family journey in terms of where I think our audience can benefit from just how families evolve and some of the tensions that exist. Or you mean there's not always smooth sailing is what you're saying? Absolutely. Well, okay. Exactly. And I think that that's important. Uh, We've we, got to we, let people know you sometimes have differences. Well, we, 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 have, we have done everything but call, I mean, we have done almost everything except for call each other a child of God. For sure. I mean, I, I think in some instances and, and it's come down to sometimes even Almost fist fights. No. Yes, we have. Oh we, we my. Have, yes, we have. This is we, exciting. We, we have we have come to we have come to. <laughs> I don't those. think I was a part of this. One. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I, I I do know of I do know of situations where those type of things happen, but I think we grow from them. Um, we have individuals who, because of the fact that they they are family, and there are some families who or some family members who figure that they should have what they have due to entitlement. Yep. Some of them did not quite get the message, or don't yeah, still that's, quite that's get the message. So, I mean, here it is to. now. We say these things, but not all everybody lives it out in terms of their everyday living and how they how they operate in terms of what they do. And so, we are proud, but at the same time, though, too, there's a lot that still we have to do as a family, meaning butlers and as well as well as others, to to be able to demonstrate what it is that we say we are about. Um, and, and make sure that we're living up, up to it. So some of the dynamics that Frankie speaks of, there is a lot of tension um, in terms of living, I mean, in terms of actually operating. Franklin would have had an operation, an, um, a situation where he would have dealt with, where he would have been, where we had an all family member board. board. In so doing, we opted to elect bringing on independent um, um, family board members, members yep. for which I supported. And in some instances, and in, in, in the latter years, I didn't support. All right, and I wanted to see what the family was able to do now and see whether there was any degree of maturity. I guess in his view was, ain't nothing changed, bro. But he was still sitting in the seat. I was not sitting in the seat. Um, and then of course experiencing that and seeing that, you kind of wonder, say, my God, I hope, we, I hope we can get it. And in some instances you still find that, well, we still struggle to get it. We well, still know, struggle, we still struggle things- to see things in a, in a very optimistic way or, we don't see things where we where we act swift enough to get things done, and the, the, and people have so many different opinions, and we never seem to come to an opinion that we can actually just carry on and let's let's move. And is so, it because is it because sometimes we are not, or we ignore to be informed properly, because I think informed decisions are the best decisions, and you know sometimes when you talk about entitlement people feel that they should have a position because they are family. And these are the dynamics that we have to look at, Absolutely. you know, as family businesses. Um, because it is family business, and I'm going through a similar thing in my arm of the business mm-hmm. where I'm um, introducing others that are non-family, because you're also going to reach a point where you have family members that aren't interested in that uh, core absolutely. business anymore, right, right. you know? Yeah. And so you've got, if you're going to have sustainability, longevity, and you know, um, just keep the business going, you've got to bring others in. But when you talk about entitlement, sometimes because the name is on the family business, they feel they should sit there. Yeah. Do you feel that sometimes? Sometimes I think that that is the case too. However, because one of the things that I would also like to, tr- I've been trying to do is to try to involve as many of them as possible because I don't want them to be distant from it. I need them to understand, or I would like for them to understand, that you ought to be a part of this and to help with its development. Um, that is not an easy thing to convey. People like the idea of being there and say, I have this position, but then the work that is involved to make it happen is another story. And you're not always able to get persons to commit to making those things happen in the way you need them to happen um, and in a timely manner. And of course, when persons see you as butlers 
doing those things and they are non-butlers, particularly those employees, then of course they have, well, a skewed look at you. Well, what is he doing? What is he trying to do? Or, or you sit on such and such a position. Why aren't you trying to exercise so-and-so? Or why does the rule apply to us but don't apply to you? All these sort of dynamics that sort of come into play because we're not true in every aspect of the word um, in terms of what we do and how we operate. Yeah. Well, I think it's very important that you've raised all of that and that Frankie has actually pivoted into that because it is not easy. Uh, well, first of all, we can't choose who our family members That's sure. are. Of course not. That's the first thing. And we're not all, as much as we um, want to say that we're all a part of it, we have to also accept the fact that not maybe all of us are qualified to be a part of this particular scenario yes. or that particular scenario. Right. And I know that's sometimes very hard to convey to a person who feels that they're entitled. No question. Right. You know? And so I think when it comes to family dynamics that we've got to make sure that we're all made accountable to the same standard. Right. It doesn't matter whether your last name is Butler or your last name is something else. When you want to run a successful enterprise, you've always got to put your best in positions. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. And I would just say, and I say this really for the benefit of our podcast audience, that you know, I'm proud today to have Alan on the show because we've had significant differences on our journey. But one of the things I think is important around this issue that you talked about in terms of independent directors or not is that history of growing up matters when you get into a professional role because people remember the stories of how you grow up. So there's no secret. I am the second youngest of the third generation. And the number one question is, I don't know the stories that we started right. talking about, mm -hmm. this history of Samilo and how you grew up. I was not a beneficiary because I was not physically in the room. Yeah, you just reached. I, that's the point. <laughs> and sometimes just reaching is a part of the reason why you don't qualify, is the point I'm making. And I don't say that because this is a problem. I say this because oftentimes these are the things that matter. Well, when, when, we, when mommy was in the trenches or when the business was at this stage, you wasn't there. So you don't know nothing about this thing. And so I really think it's important for the benefit of our audience to recognize that these differences, and that was one of the reasons why for me, independent directors were important. Because there were times when I felt that cousins did not judge me on my merit. They judged me on their own histories that they had perhaps with my father or their fathers. And I felt that that was always a shadow that lingered over my kind of tenure as CEO of the business because there was always this conversa conversation about correcting the past. And I would remind people, if you want to go see my daddy, his grave right on St. Matthew Cemetery, there's some things you need to go talk to him about because I can't solve them. Right. And so I just tell people, I, I, I share this for the benefit of our audience because, Alan, as you know, these are many of the conversations that keep us Indeed. looking backward. Right. Not necessarily with the pride of the podcast, but looking backward to kind of correct some of the sins, perhaps, of the past, right. and not necessarily focus on charting the way forward. And so I think that's a beautiful segue to tell us what's in store for the future of Milo Butler. As it stands right now, as far as Milo Butler is concerned, we are trying to, um, we have closed down the Milo Butler Mart as it stands right now, and we have ventured into just doing the, the liquor stores and the, um, the, warehouse, the warehouse distribution. Um, we thought that we would con on that and try to see whether or not that would actually keep us, not just keep us afloat, but actually try to see how best we could segue ourselves into that, that line of business and to, to actually just create a framework of keeping that sort of thing going. We also so are have you going through a reorganizational um, process? transition right now? Yes, we are going through a reorganizational transition and also looking at other means by which we can do because we found that a lot of the stuff that we were doing were really not relevant um, for us and neither can we keep up with it at this present moment. So with that, we had to we had to make some cutbacks and actually begin to see exactly what the way forward should look like. Yeah, you and, must be very creative. And you well. have to and you have to be very creative in this space now to to really try to see exactly what you do next um, to try to see if this is what the family wants us to continue with. Then what do you do to try to make this a going concern? and to maintain relevancy moving forward. Well, and that know, in itself- it's interesting you should but say- But we're, we're not even there yet as far no. as coming to what concrete we're gonna go forward with, but however, we're in that transition right yeah, now. Yeah, you should, it's, it's interesting because once again, when you look at whatever it is you're doing, um, you, you come with the information, armed with the information of what makes sense and what doesn't. 
And while sometimes you would have individ individuals that want you to do certain things, once you present the facts, hey, this is the product that really is going to move, you know, because, you know, inventory has to be constantly moving, you know. I, I think Mr. Moss spoke about it in terms of um, returns. Absolutely. You know, you've got to have that constant return. So you can't tie yourself up in things that's not moving. So once you give them an informed decision as to what is moving and the way forward and modernization, you know, I, I think that then you'll come together. So great. That's wonderful you're going through this. Um, and when do you hope to have that all sort of concretized in terms of concretization i think we'll probably have it concretized in about another six months awesome great yeah. awesome so alan i know it's brief time that you've been uh, in the business any lessons learned or reflections you know in your brief tenure in terms of things that you want to share with our guests in terms of what it takes to lead a complicated third generation family business and a bit of a conglomerate to be very honest with you. yes <laughs> um it takes an awful lot of patience it takes a lot of, you have to really stand alone in many spaces, despite the fact that you are dealing with family. You have to stand your ground on a lot of things that, and you cannot compromise a whole lot. You really have to really know exactly what it is that you are about and what it is that you wish to achieve and what goals you have set for the, for the, for the business at large to actually move forward to. Um, one of the things I think that is, it has caused me to do now too is, to seek outside advice. So I may not have independent directors, but I am constantly seeking outside advice by individuals who I figure I could men who could mentor me in terms of trying to be able to um, um, understand and, and appreciate where I am in my space and maybe some things I may be overlooking. Um, so that, that's, that has been my learning experience. Have you ever heard the experience. saying, um, Heavy is the head that wears, wears the, the crown. crown. Absolutely. Have you ever heard the saying that it's lonely at the top? Yes, I have. Let me tell you something. That is why it is so important. There are many that have advice when you're at the top, yep. but do not appreciate truly the sleepless nights, the decisions that need to be made. Absolutely. How the bills are going to be paid. Absolutely. And why you're making the decisions that you're making. And I can only tell you that these are all the real dynamics that we must convey to the audience as well. Absolutely. You know, in terms of them no understanding that it's not a cakewalk. It's not. In, in any type of business, especially when you're dealing with multiple arms of families that come under one umbrella family. Yep, right. And when you're dealing with multiple um, aspects of the business. Absolutely. It's not easy. And yes, there's going to be confrontation. And yes, there are going to be people who are going to, um, you know, just be totally obtuse, if yep. you will. Right. Yep. You know, now don't let them come to no fist fight like you say, yeah. you know, but... Yeah. You know, these are the challenges we go through in, in family, family business, yes. in business in general. Absolutely. You know, but family dynamics even more so. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad to hear that you actually um, realize that, you know, not everything is resident within your organization in right. terms of your knowledge. Right. You must, must, must um, engage the very best advice that you can. Absolutely. And I've been trying to, to make sure that I, I do that and make sure I, I'm try to keep myself, you know, um, learned <laughs> a prize of what's going on and that sort of thing, et cetera, and in that space. Great. Alan, I want to thank you. My hope today was really just to share a little bit more dynamics around the beauty and the challenges of family business. I hope our audience had an opportunity to just get a little sense now listen, we don't fight and carry on too much now. We have our own way. I'm sure every family has their culture of the dynamics of transitions because since my transition where I was probably the first, third generation to be a part of it, we've had two. Well, you, are the, you would have been two more, actually. My brother, Damon, and then yourself right. as a CEO of the business. And so obviously we are a business who have not necessarily perfected transitions, but we're certainly working on it. And so I'm really glad to have you on this show, Alan. But we haven't died either. That's exactly the point. We you know, that's died. important. Yep. And, and so if and you look we, at... And we keep going. And, and you, one of the good things, too, what we've also tried to do is to include, in my, in my phase, is to actually include one of the fourth generations 
um, actually G4 is on the board of directors as well too. So he could learn the process and the procedures and so on and have an Who's understanding. That? Um, Bentley. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. All right. So we actually have him on board as well too. And he has really taken it by, you know, taken it by storm to really try to see how best he can help in that area. And that, that energy has been what is needed. And I guess it's a fresh, and another a breath perspective of fresh air. from a young person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Bentley right. is well clued and I spent a lot of time with him otherwise mentoring. So, and it's good, it's good to expose, um, even though that's not his discipline. Absolutely. But it's good to expose him to that and to hear from a younger person's perspective. perspective pers exactly. An intelligent young absolutely. person. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know. Loretta, yes. listen, man, thank you. I love hosting this thing with you. It's a pleasure, you know. Alan is our first family member to be on this podcast. No, 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 no. He's not our first no, family our, member. He's our right. first, first cousin. First, first cousin. You're He's right. He's our that's first, it. first cousin that's to right. be on because we've had second cousins on. That's right. Thank you and for keeping so, me honest. And so I just want you to know that, you know, I, I have watched Alan um, really from baby. <laughs> up to well you see how big babies grow in our family eh? <laughs> i mean we do grow big uh, <laughs> but alan's now he's a big baby but no i've had the privilege of knowing alan i guess before alan would have known himself and you know i just want to say to you alan you know all of those lessons that you've learned along the way whether it's from grammy and granddaddy aunt nita uncle frank your own parents um, your cousins. I'm glad you shared your challenges with us, but I want you to be encouraged. Yep. I, I want you to be encouraged because, you know, um, there's always another opportunity. Yep. Okay. And once you keep at it, we will continue to grow from success to success. Absolutely. And that is the key. I've watched you grow from childhood. You now have your own family. Like I say, you're a big baby now, and um, you know you have to occupy this space the same way that Granddaddy and Grammy and our forebears they occupied this space. You've got to do it, and you've got to show that we have the resilience to go on to be a G4 or a G5, and so yes. on and so forth as Black Bahamian Disney, people. Disney. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I think we are an example to other Bahamians um, at large too, because they sometimes get their compass based upon how we operate. Um, and I, I, I don't take that lightly. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to be able to understand the level of responsibility we have as Bahamians at large, as well as, but as butlers. That's right. Great. Well, we want to really say, Franklin, this has been wonderful to have Alan on board with us today. We're going to be focusing a lot more on our Generation 3 and other young Bahamians well. and even younger generations because we know that this podcast is not just being listened to by older people. And by having younger persons and having our G3s come in, they have an, a circle of influence that will be watching to hear their stories. So I want to thank you, Franklin, for being my co-host. I want to thank the Butler Legacy, Legacy Foundation for making this happen. Of course, our sponsors here at Bahamar at the beautiful Echo, Echo Gallery. Gallery, which is always phenomenal. And of course, once again, kudos to our executive producers. Alan, thank you for taking this time out and it's being with us. We want to thank everyone and our audience for tuning in and making us the greatest podcast in the Bahamas. Yep. So just before we wrap up, audience, please remember to follow us on YouTube, uh, Apple Podcasts, as well as Spotify, where you can find this podcast. We want you also to share, like. Uh, we think our story is incredible, and our hope is really to inspire others. So thank you guys so much, Loretta. Thank you, Alan. Pleasure. And uh, enjoy. Thank you very much, everyone.